Welcome to Social Psychology, Psych 230. Today we're continuing our, uh, our chapter on um, attraction uh, and, uh, and, ro and romantic relationships. And we left off talking about, um, you know, the good genes hypothesis and the good investment hypothesis. We also talked before about who's sexually attractive, right? We talked about social sexual orientation that some people prefer more of and, you know, are more open when it comes to sex, sex without love, you know, anything, anything goes kind of thing where some people are more restricted. And we, and we looked at some research that basically shows that in general, on average, men are less restricted when it comes to sex than women. Women are more restricted. For men, it's like, yeah, I mean, they're more open to it, right? Friends, strangers, you know, um, not, not as, uh, you know, as, uh, as uh, restricted as women are. And we started talking about, uh, you know, the reasons for this, okay? Like, so here are some reasons why uh, some people are considered more attractive than others or why certain things are desirable. So we talked about the good genes hypothesis and we said that basically features that indicate basically good genes are more attractive in people. So we talked about how, you know, how if you're a man, if you're tall, you have a large jaw and you look more like a uh, stronger physical specimen that you would produce more, you know, stronger offspring, so to speak, more capable of surviving. And if you're a woman, if you're basically, if you look more fertile, you know, if you have longer legs, you know, uh, bigger boobs, you know, a nice shiny hair and you look pretty, how it's an indication or it's supposed to be an indication indirectly that you are healthier and fertile and young and basically still have a lot of years left to reproduce and can produce more healthy offspring. And we also mentioned the good investment hypothesis, how certain things are desirable in, uh, in partners, like having, like uh, for instance, having a good job, uh, being intelligent, being kind and nurturing, right? Why are those things important? Because those things relate to uh, being a good investment which also has to do with producing offspring. If, you're, if you have characteristics like kindness, nurturing, right, intelligence, good job, that kind of stuff, then that means you're more desirable because you're a good investment. You're a good choice to make for offspring as well because you have a good job and you'll be able to provide, right? You're kind and nurturing, so you'll be able to do a better job raising children as opposed to someone who's mean and aggressive, right? And that's why those things are desirable, right? So. The, uh, you know, are you a good, uh, do you have good genes? Are you a good investment, right? Though there's different things that fall within those, within those categories, right? Uh, that make you desirable. Just about everything you can think of falls into, into either good genes, good investment, Some, something that makes someone desirable, right? It either falls into good genes or good investment. If it's something physical, it's an indication of good genes according to the hypothesis. If it's something that has to do with how you are as a person and it makes you desirable, that means that uh, it's more of uh, an investment. You're a good investment, so to speak. Um, let's keep going. Something else that explains differences that exist between men and women, um, as far as uh, what they're attracted to, or even different, uh, actually this relates more to differences in uh, how you know, restricted men and women are when it comes to sex. Like we said, plenty of research shows that men are more unrestricted. They're more likely to have sex with a stranger, more likely to view friends as potential sex partners and uh, you know, sex without love, that kind of stuff. Women are a little bit more choosy, a little bit more restricted. Why is that? Okay, uh, parental investment theory uh, has an explanation for that. Um, I'm gonna have to ex explain this because there's, I'm gonna tell you more than what's written here, but uh, parental investment theory basically mentions that there's different child rearing investment. In other words, when it comes to raising children, you know, uh, people, some people do more than others. And on average, there's more investment on the part of women. Women are the ones who get pregnant, by the way. They're the ones who have to nurse the child, okay? And they're the ones who do most of the child rearing. Men said that they're gonna, they say that they're gonna help and a lot of them do help, but they don't do nearly as much as women. They are not physically capable as doing as much as, as women. They don't get pregnant. They don't give birth, which I hear is very painful, by the way. They don't really, you know, lactate and get to nurse, right? They can hold the child and take care of the child and bottle feed the child, but they don't, usually don't do as much as women. Even when they try, they fall way short of what women do, okay? They contribute a lot less. Biologically, what it comes down to 
is what men contribute when it comes to basically, uh, you know, when it comes to child, child rearing, many times it just comes down to the time needed for sex and the sperm. There are many men that that's all they contribute. They have sex with a woman, they get her pregnant, and then they don't do much else. They say they're gonna help you, but they don't do much. They don't breastfeed, they don't get pregnant, they don't give birth, they can't do that, but they may not even do much beyond that, right? Help out the kid with their homework that much, or just hold them as much. Um, a lot of men nowadays do more, but a lot of them still don't do that much or don't do enough. And you'll almost always have the case that men do not do enough. And you almost have, almost always have those arguments in a marriage, in a relationship, if you have kids, that you don't do enough and you need to do more and, you know, and then there's arguments because of that. Okay, there's a lot more cost for women. Women have to do most of the work. That's what parental investment theory says. And because of different investment, women have to invest a lot more into child rearing. And that's what sex is about, by the way. That's why, that's what relationships exist because eventually it gets down to reproduction. That is the whole purpose of it, okay? That's why the sexual, um, you know, that's why the sexual arousal, it can be so strong. Well, that's why the need to be with others can be so strong in a romantic relationship, right? Um, there's also a different potential reproduction. And this is not just according to parental investment theory, this is just facts, okay? Women can only reproduce about every nine months. Get pregnant, it takes about nine months to reach full term, and then you can give birth. And then to give birth again, you usually have to wait another nine, month, nine months. Actually, it, it, it's more like once a year because uh, doctors tell you that, you know, you should really not start having sex right away, right after you give birth. You need to wait you know, several weeks, depending on how difficult the birth was. Uh, you know, several weeks, if you've had a C-section or if you had a difficult birth, you might need to wait months, okay? So they tell you that you shouldn't really start having sex right away, right after you give birth, okay? So it's really more like once a year, okay? Men, on the other hand, um, how often can they reproduce, right? Men are only limited by how many women they can impregnate. Women can impregnate one woman, then another, then another. It's not every nine months. A man can become a father, uh, you know, a lot more often, okay? And women only have so many years where they continue to produce uh, ova, right? Uh, so, you know, that is fertilized by the sperm and, uh, and then they can get pregnant and give birth. Uh, men continue to produce sperms, uh, I mean, for most of their lifespan. So a, a man can even become a father when he's in his 70s. Uh, I don't know when it stops. I don't think it ever stops, to tell you the truth. They continue producing sperm. Okay, uh, as long as they're alive, I guess. Um, so women are very limited in how often they can reproduce. Men, not so much. Um, when it comes to the woman that has had the most children, I don't remember the exact statistics because it keeps changing, uh, you know, and some, every now and then somebody breaks the record. But I think there was a woman that had uh, like uh, 52 kids or something like that, or maybe 40 something, I don't remember exactly. But you can't have, an infant number of children if you are a woman. You're only limited by, you know, how many ova you can produce in the nine month pregnancy and how many years in which you're gonna be fertile. But that is nowhere close to how often men can reproduce. 40 something kids, 50 something kids, whatever it is, right? Uh, the, the, basically the, um, the record for like the man who has a uh, father of the most children, right? It, it's more like 1500. There is this king of some oil producing country that has 1,500 children, more than 1,500. How is that possible? Well, he has a lot of uh, wives and he has concubines and he has sex slaves and he has sex with a whole bunch of different women all the time. And it seems like every time he has sex with them, he impregnates one of them. And he's the father to like 1,500 children. So men can reproduce a lot more than women. And women, so women have, more cost and they're more limited in how often they can reproduce. When men have less cost and are not that limited. And according to the theory, because of this, you're gonna have, uh, because of this parental investment, uh, women, men and women are gonna have, are gonna be different when it comes to their mate selection. They're gonna be different as, you know, when it comes to approaching sex, okay? Because of the differences they have, because men don't have a lot of cost, they're not gonna be that picky. It's not a big deal for them. For women, it is a big deal, so they need to be more careful. 
So men and women, because of differential parental investment, men and women have evolved different criteria for mate selection. Women are more interested in features that signal a good investment. Does the guy have resources? Does he have a good job? Does he have money? Is, is he intelligent? If he's intelligent, maybe he can get a good job in the future and get some money in the future, right? Is he kind, right? Is he loyal? Is he uh, generous, right? All those things matter. All those things have to do with good investment. Women, according to this theory, are looking for someone who's, in, who's a good investment, someone who's gonna stick around in the long run, help them raise those kids. Women can only have so many and they need to, they basically need to take care of the few that they can, that they can have. So they need someone who's a good investment. Men, because they don't really have a lot of cost when it comes to reproduction, they don't really have to provide much more than the sperm and the time needed for sex. They don't have to do more than that. They can, but they don't have to. Uh, and uh, because of that, um, and so, so they're not really, um, they don't have a lot of cost and they could also father a lot more children than women. They can, they can have a lot more children in, in general. They don't give birth to them, but they can be a father much, many more times than women can be mothers, okay? Because of this, they're more interested in, so in basically in the numbers game, so to speak. They're more interested in good genes. They're more interested in basically things that indicate that the woman is young, healthy, attractive, so that she still has a lot of years to produce lots of offspring. So men benefit most by basically impregnating as many women as they can, according to evolutionary theory, right? They, um, that's why they're so attracted to things that indicate good genes. They're like, they like someone who's attractive, someone who's young, someone who has nice lustrous shiny hair. We talked about that, that hourglass figure. What is all that an indication of? According to you know, the uh, good genes hypothesis, those all indicate uh, basically uh, fertility and health. And that's according to parental investment theory, that's what men are looking for. Because for men, the best strategy for them to ensure their offspring survive is to have a lot of them. If you have a lot of them, some of them are gonna survive just by chance. Women don't have that luxury. Women could only produce so many, so they have to take care of the few that they can produce. So women have to be more interested in a good investment. Men are gonna be more interested in good genes according to parental investment theory. And that explains a lot of differences between, we see between men and women. Why men are so open to sex, it's no big deal for them, right? They don't have a lot of the cost. For women, it is a big deal. Pregnancy is a big deal. Becoming a mother is more of a big deal to women, right? They have more cost. And therefore, they have to be more picky about who they have sex with. It's not just anyone. That's what parental investment theory says and explains some differences between men and women, right? Why men are so open to it and women are not. Another theory that explains these differences that we see uh, is called sexual strategies theory, proposed by Bush, Buss and Schmidt in uh, 1993. Um, Buss and Schmidt basically said that, according to sexual strategies theory, uh, different, there are differential costs and benefits to mating that are involved for men and women. And we mentioned those already, okay? Women have more cost, okay? And they can reproduce less often. Men have less cost and they therefore take a more, uh, a different approach, okay? Because of these differential costs and benefits, um, they have evolved different mating strategies. Women take more of a long-term mating strategy. Women are looking more toward the long-term. And that means that they're more interested in a good investment. Sure, looks do matter, genes do matter to women. But according to this theory, the other stuff that has to do with, you know, a good investment matters more. Men on the other hand, because they don't have a lot of cost and they get a lot of benefit uh, from mating, from sex, uh, they're, they have more of a short-term strategy. They're more interested in physical features. Is she young? Is she healthy? Is she beautiful, right? That kind of stuff. They have more of a short-term strategy. Women benefit from long-term mating by securing resources and support for their children, right? They wanna secure someone who's a good investment. Men benefit from short-term mating by increasing the number of offspring they can produce. Women are looking for youth and attractiveness uh, and things that indicate good genes and they wanna spread themselves around more. 
they want to have sex with more women. We saw research that indicates that, right? That's a short-term strategy. Their approach is, according to the according to sexual strategies theory, which is more uh, falls in within evolutionary theory, is that basically men, in order to ensure their offspring survive, their natural tendency is to want to have more sex and impregnate more women. Women, their natural tendency is to find someone who's a good investment, less partners and people who are worth it in the long run, okay? That's what that theory says. And it explains some of these differences that we see between men and women as far as their preferences and what they're attracted to, okay? Um, sexual economics theory, another theory that explains differences between men and women. Um, economics is about the exchange of benefits, okay? So according to sexual economics theory, sex is a female resource. In other words, sex is something women can use to their advantage, okay? Sex has a low cost for men. They don't get pregnant. They don't do most of the showering. Sex has low cost for men, but it has high cost for women. Therefore, men want sex more than women. Women have to be more careful when it comes to sex. Men don't have to be that careful. So men want it more uh, uh, naturally than women do because it's not a big deal for them. So sex is something that women can use to, the, to their advantage because men want it so much and it's no big deal for them, right? To have sex and for women, it is a big deal and they, should, they, they can't be as open about it. Therefore, women are gonna more be more restricted when it comes to sex, men less restrictive. Another way of saying that, men want sex more than women according to sexual economics theory. And because of that, women can use sex to their advantage. Women can exchange sex to obtain other resources. Sex is not a male resource. Sex is not something that males can use to their advantage. Males cannot exchange sex for resources. Males cannot say, you know, if I have sex with you, right? Uh, I, oh, I'll have sex with you if you buy me a car or something like that, or if you give me some money. But it does work the other way. Women can get paid for sex. Women can get all kinds of things, cars and gifts and houses and all kinds of things uh, for sex. And we know that happens in our society and in actually all societies out there, right? Uh, so males cannot exchange sex for resources. Instead, males exchange resources for sex. Men give things to women so they can get sex is what the theory says, okay? So as a woman, you can use sex to your advantage because men want it so much, right? You can use it to your advantage to get what you want. Men can't use sex to get what they want. Men have to use other things to get sex. And we see that and it's very, it's, it's very obvious. Okay, um, prostitution is the lowest form of that, by the way, but it doesn't have to be prostitution in any relationship. But in especially in romantic relationships, uh, there is an exchange there. You're giving something for something. What men are usually giving are other things. What women are usually giving is sex, according to the theory. And there are things that increase female sex value and things that decrease female sex value. In other words, there are things about a woman that make it so that she can ask for more stuff. She can ask for more things, things that increase her sex value. So basically it's like, you wanna be with her in a relationship. You wanna have sex with her. It doesn't have to be prostitution, but you wanna be with her. You better have a lot more. You br better bring a lot more to the table. If you have certain features, you can ask for more. If you don't have those features, then you can't ask for as much. So there are things that increase your value, right? Your sex value and things that decrease it. And remember, according to the theory as a woman, you are exchanging sex for those other things. Now you might be saying, wait a minute, I don't do that, I haven't even had sex. You don't have to give sex. It's just the promise of it, being in a relationship with you, even if you're not having sex and you're making him wait, he will give you things and will do all sorts of things to try to get there eventually. Okay, there are things that make you more valuable and there are things that make you less valuable as someone who exchanges sex for resources. I know that sounds bad, but that's what the theory says. And this is very obvious. As a woman, if you are attractive, men want you more. Men wanna have sex with you more. And therefore you can ask for more. If you're a very attractive woman, 
you can uh, you you can basically say, yeah, you know what? I want a guy who has it all. I want to make sure I want he has to be intelligent. He has to be tall and handsome and have a good job and be kind and generous and all these things. And if you're a very attractive woman, you can get all those things. And by the way, attractiveness is a relative thing. It varies, by the way. OK. It's a relative thing. It depends on who's around you. You might think where you are that you're very attractive, but if you go to another setting, you just might be average, okay? And you might not be able to get as much in that setting, okay? If you're as attractive as the models that you see on TV or as these celebrities, yeah, you can have it all. You can make sure the man that you end up with has it all himself, that he's nice and kind and rich and famous and tall and good looking, right? I'm not saying all women want those things or ask for those things or all women, most women want those things, I'll say that, I will say that. But I'm saying, I'm not saying all women will get those things or all women will prioritize those things. But if you are very attractive as a woman, if you play your cards right, you can get all those things. There are plenty of guys out there with those features who are dying to be with somebody like you. If you are very attractive, they want you bad, okay? Also, if you're young, youth goes along with attractiveness. You are better looking when you're younger. That is the most, one of the most attractive things about you is your youth, if you don't know. You might compare yourself to other women your age and maybe think you're not that attractive, okay? But you are. When you're younger, you look a lot better than when you're older. Trust me, an average looking 20-something year old is a lot more desirable than even a good looking 50 year old in my opinion. Youth is one of the most attractive things. Trust me, to older people, if you're in your late teens, early 20s, to people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, you look amazing, okay? You look great, okay? So youth and attractiveness go together, okay? If you're young, you're usually more attractive. Sexy clothing, yeah, you can, uh, wearing sexy clothing, it makes you look more attractive. It makes you show a little skin, you show a little cleavage, a little bit of leg. You show off more of your features and it makes men want you even more. And therefore you can ask for a better man, okay? Uh, few sexual partners. Hey, if you haven't had a lot of sex partners, uh, if you're, and let's take that to the extreme. If you're a virgin, guess what? You are more desirable than if you've had a bunch of partners, okay? Um, that's just something that, uh, you know, that men want. All men, if they, if they, I would say, maybe not all, maybe I'm stereotyping here, but most men, if they had a choice, would pick a virgin over someone who isn't a virgin, if they're equally desirable in all other ways, okay? They'd rather be with someone who hasn't been with somebody else. And we'll talk about why in a moment, we'll get to other theories. High male sex drive, if he has a strong sex drive, a strong urge, right? He really wants to have sex a lot. That means he's desperate. He's willing to give a lot more. Give a lot more in general to have sex and give a lot more, especially to be with someone who is attractive or someone who has high female sex value. If you live in a society with restrictive sexual norms, women become more desirable. If you live in a society where prostitution is not allowed, where pornography is not allowed, where sex outside of marriage is not allowed, then that means men find it harder to get sex men find it harder to relieve themselves of their sex drive and they have to work harder to get sex. And what does that mean? It means they have to compete more. They have to basically, they have to be better men in order to get sex. They have to have a better job. They have to be better looking. They have to be uh, nicer, more intelligent, good manners, all that stuff. The more restricted the society, the better men have to behave to get sex, okay? Scarcity of women. The less women there are, the more men have to compete and fight over the few that there are. And that means that they have to raise their game. They have to bring more to the table. Money, intelligence, good job, kindness, good looks, all that stuff. But just like there are things that increase female sex value, there are also things that decrease female sex value. Things that will make it so that men aren't willing to give you that much. That you are not worth that much. They don't want you that bad sexually okay so one of those so it's the opposite things unattractiveness if you're not that attractive uh guess what it's going to be harder for you to find a good looking man a guy who has it all who's rich and and who has a good job and is kind all that stuff 
If you're unattractive, you have less choices. Also, if you're older, if you're older, you're just less attractive. Even if you were good looking when you're younger, when you're older, you don't look as good. It's just what happens as you age. You can have surgery if you have the money, by the way, and continue to look good like celebrities do. And then that will increase your chances. But old age in general just makes you less attractive. High female sex drive, right? If you're very horny, you want sex a lot, then that means that you're gonna give it up more easily. And that means you're gonna be able to get less, okay? Because you want it just as much as he does, or if you want it even more, then that means that he doesn't have to be that great because you want it bad, okay? If you have a lot of sex partners, uh, you're not as desirable as uh, sex partners. Like I said, most men would wanna be with someone who hasn't had a lot of sex partners. And actually, ideally, they probably want a virgin. Most of them won't get one, but that's the reality, okay? They want someone who hasn't had a lot of sex partners, who hasn't slept around a lot. And we'll talk about why in a moment. Uh, high male status, guess what? If he's rich, famous, he has a lot of status, then, then that means that he is worth a lot and therefore you have to work harder to get him if he has a lot of status. Uh, ever notice, right, you see on TV, those people who are celebrities, rich and famous, when they're men, they almost always have a very attractive woman by their side, very attractive wife or girlfriend who, or who they're dating, right? They're high status, right? They have a lot. So therefore, they can ask for a lot, right? And they always almost want someone who's very attractive. When the female lacks resources, if women are very poor, that means they're more desperate. And that, mean the, that means the man doesn't have to have a lot. He has a job, right? He has something that might be enough. As Americans, by the way, uh, we're relatively well off in this country compared to other people. Uh, not compared to all countries, but in uh, this is usually a richer country than a lot of other countries. And as an American, just with a regular job, right? You just happen to be, let's say, middle class, or maybe not even middle class, you're lower class here. You can go to another country, and in that country, you're practically rich compared to how poor they are. And, and men have done this. Men have gone to other countries and found themselves a bride from there. Gone back to, gone to another country or maybe the country that they immigrate from that's a poor country and often find themselves a much better looking woman there and bring her to the US than they could get here in the US. And that's the reality because to them you're rich and to them you're desirable, okay? Just for the very fact that you're an American, they wanna live in the US, that makes you more desirable, okay? Scarcity of women, oh yeah, so scarcity of women, if, if, the, if there's not a, a scarcity of men, I should say, if there's not a lot of men, that means that women have to compete for men. And that means get men get to have their way. They don't have to be that nice. They don't have to be that well off. They don't have to be that good of men because there's not enough men to go around. So you have to compete for them and some women are gonna be without men. So that you know what happens when there's not a lot of men, what research shows, when there's not a lot of men, and that's the reality, by the way, because men get involved in wars and, uh, and are more likely to kill each other. Uh, there's actually less men in the world uh, than women. And especially in some countries, and even in the US, uh, there's less men than there are women. And that usually means that women have to compete more uh, to get a good man, okay? And you know what research shows? Like after World War II or after a big war, something like that where a lot of men had died, you know what research shows? Uh, about women, uh, when there's not a lot of men, skirts get shorter, dresses get shorter. Women have to entice men by showing a bit more skin, by being a little bit more flirty or just basically uh, competing for men. That's what happens when there's fewer men. And that's what we have now. There's usually fewer men than women. Uh, permissive sexual norms. Okay, if we live in a society where pornography is allowed, prostitution is allowed, uh, sex out of marriage is okay, you're not going to get thrown in jail for it or executed for it, then that means that men can have their uh, urge relieved um, more easily. That means they can get sex more easily or they can masturbate and, you know, to pornography or things like that. And that means they're not that desperate. They don't have to work as hard for a good woman to get sex. They don't have to work that hard. They do have to work hard for a good woman, but they don't have to work that hard to get sex. They can just go pay a few bucks for it. They can watch pornography and masturbate. And then that relieves their desire for a time. And then they're not so desperate. Okay. And yes, that's the kind of society we live in now. 
We have prostitution. We have pornography. All those things make it harder for women to find a good man. You're trying to find a good man, a, a good man, right? And then there's these women out there who are giving up for a few bucks. There's women having sex on TV or in, in, in movies and videos that men can masturbate to and therefore relieve their urges and then they don't have to work as hard to get sex from you. That's what the theory says. And I think it explains a lot about our society. But let's keep going because there's more. Um, that was sexual economics theory. It says some very kind of crude things about women, but I think some things that are very true as well. Um, something else, uh, because we're talking about resources and status, right? Uh, and some of the and some of these things are theories and some of them are just studies, but here's a study that was done on jealousy that explains some of the things that we just talked about. There was a study that was done where both men and women were asked to imagine, right? Imagine the person with whom you've been seriously involved with, right? Your partner has become interested in somebody else. You're asked to imagine this, to close your eyes that they are involved with somebody else, seriously involved with somebody else, right? And they have you imagine this stuff. They ask you later on, right? What would distress you more? What would make you more upset? Finding out that, well, imagining your partner, that imagining that your partner has fallen in love with somebody else, right? That they have formed a deep emotional attachment to somebody else, or that your partner uh, is having sex with somebody else. What would upset you more? And if we were doing this face to face, I could ask you guys this and I could survey you guys and I could find out what the percentages are, right? And I could find out what the differences are between men and women. Here's the thing, this shouldn't be uh, surprising. The study showed that men are more distressed over sexual infidelity. In other words, what men find more upsetting, what they're more jealous about is sex. Them imagining their partner having sex with somebody else is the most upsetting. It is more upsetting than imagining that their partner is in love with somebody else. Now, of course, if this happens for real, it's even more upsetting, okay? Women, on the other hand, the research study found that, uh, that women are more distressed over emotional attachment, that women find it more upsetting if the man has fallen in love with somebody else than if he's having sex with somebody else. Isn't that surprising, right? No, not really, right? We kind of expected this. What's going on here? Why do we have these differences? Men are very jealous about sex. That's why they don't want you talking to other guys, hanging out with other guys, even if they're just friends, they're very jealous, right? Uh, they wanna know who you're talking to. Some of them are very jealous, right? Uh, they're concerned that you might uh, have sex with somebody else. Women also get jealous, but according to research, they're more concerned about you falling in love with somebody else. And it's, and it's instinctively, it's like men know this because when you catch a man cheating, right? You find out he's been having sex with somebody else. What does he usually say to make you feel better? What he usually says is, I don't love her. I only love you. It was just sex. It didn't mean anything. That's the excuse they almost always give. It's like they instinctively know that you care more about love than sex. But if a woman is caught cheating, she can't make that same excuse. A woman can't say when she's caught cheating, right? Uh, whether, and by the way, you better make sure that it doesn't happen live, that it doesn't catch you in the act because that can, be, that can be very dangerous. If a man catches you doing that, right? Your partner with somebody else, he's gonna get very upset and probably, I'm not kidding, he'll probably try to beat the crap out of you or maybe kill you. It's very upsetting to a man, right? Um, you better hope he doesn't have a gun, right? Um, I'm not saying all men are, are, are that way. If you have a good man, he'll just get very upset and maybe run away crying or something like that. But a lot of men are likely to get aggressive and violent or at least try to beat the crap out of the person you are having sex with. But when a woman is caught cheating, hopefully it's not in the act, but maybe he finds out some other way, right? Uh, the woman cannot give that same excuse. It doesn't help her if she says, I don't love him, it was just sex. You tell him that and he's gonna, he's gonna become even more upset. That's exactly what he cares about is sex, according to this study. That's what he's most jealous about. You can't get away with that excuse. Many women will forgive a man for having sex with somebody else. If they say, I don't love her, I only love you. It was, I was drunk, it was a mistake. It doesn't mean anything, right? But as a woman, you are having sex with somebody else. It's a lot harder for a man to forgive you for that, okay? Why is this? Why do we have these differences? 
um, it's uh, there are evolutionary differences. It, it all has to do with uh, parental uncertainty. Okay, according to research. Okay, parental uncertainty. Parental uncertainty is basically, uh, you know, um, how sure you are that the kids you're raising are actually yours. How sure are you that you're the father, that you're the mother? Here's the sad truth about being a man, about being a male, okay? Males have high parental uncertainty, okay? They are never 100% certain that the children they're actually raising are actually theirs. Never 100% certain that they are the father and that they are not devoting resources to somebody else's child. They are not 100% sure they can never be 100% sure that those children are actually theirs and that they're not giving all these things to somebody else's child. That's the sad truth about being a man, okay? Maybe there could be a DNA test or something like that and that can narrow it down and say maybe 98, 99% chance you are the father, right? Something like that. But short of that, you're really not certain as a man. And that's why men are very sensitive to sexual infidelity. That's why men are so jealous when it comes to sex. That's why they don't want you talking to other men, hanging out with other men. That's why they're so jealous. And some men take this to the extreme and are very difficult about it, right? Other men are not as jealous, but that's why men are so jealous about sex. It is the most upsetting thing to them. Very upsetting. How upsetting is it for a man? Well, you've heard the, about the insanity plea, how people can plead insanity when they kind of killed somebody, right? The history of that has to do with uh, a man actually catching his wife having sex with an uh, with a you know with another man. He was so upset he shot them both. He went and got his gun and shot them both dead. This was more than a hundred years ago, I believe. I don't remember the date, of course. Um, he got himself a good lawyer and he pleaded insanity. Right? That he said that he was so upset by catching his wife in the act with another man that he temporarily went insane and he killed them. He couldn't help himself, and it worked. That is, that is where the insanity plea comes from. That is how upsetting it is to find, for a man to find out that his woman is having sex with somebody else, his wife, girlfriend, whatever it is. It is extremely upsetting. And yes, some of them will get violent, okay? Females have no parental uncertainty. Women are 100% certain that they are the mother when they're raising those children. Why? Because they gave birth to it. They know it's theirs. A man doesn't have that privilege. The privilege of, I'm not saying the privilege of giving birth, but the privilege of basically of being 100% certain that they are the father. They could have sex with the woman. She got pregnant. They could see her give birth. That doesn't mean it's his. And as a matter of fact, a small percentage of men, I don't remember the exact percentage, might be 5, 10%. A small percentage of men are actually raising somebody else's child and don't even know it. And how do we know this? Because of course, you know, children go to the doctor a lot and they, and, and they take blood samples, they check for all sorts of things. And every now and then they find out that, you know, this man just, it's impossible. He's not the father, he can't be. And they usually don't say anything, but a small percentage of men actually are raising somebody else's child and don't even know it, okay? Women, they know that's their child, they gave birth to it. So women are not, don't have so much sexual, uh, uh, you know, they're not so jealous about sex because of that. And instead, they're more jealous about emotional finality. And instead, they have to be, they're more jealous about the long term, right? Is he going to stick around? Is he going to provide? Is he going to help me raise these children? And that is more, uh, that, that, that has more to do with love. If he loves you, he's going to stick around. He's more likely to stick around, more likely to help you. If he doesn't love you, then he's probably not going to stick around. And he's probably going to cheat on you. And it's probably gonna give some stuff, some of those resources, some of that kindness, what he has to offer to somebody else other than you and your child. So women are more jealous about love. That's the explanation according to parental uncertainty, right? This theory of parental uncertainty. Let's keep going because I feel like I'm going too slow. Okay, I am going too slow. I get too much into this and then I have to rush at the end. So I need to move faster. Okay, um, other things about deception. Men and women differ in how upsetting they find certain deceptions, okay? According to research, what men find most upsetting when they are lied, when they are lied to by, a, you know, their partner, their romantic partner, uh, we're talking about heterosexual relationships here, but I guess you could apply them to other relationships. But uh, what men find most upsetting 
right, is when they are lied to or deceived about these things. For men, it's sexual access. That's one thing. In other words, he thought he was going to get some sex, and he doesn't. He finds that very upsetting when you lie to him about that, when you deceive him about that, okay? Sexual infidelity, of course, very upsetting. We talked about that, right? When he finds out that you're having sex with somebody else, he finds that very upsetting. Sexual promiscuity, when he finds out that you've had a lot of sex partners, then you led him to believe. He finds that very upsetting, okay? When he finds out you've been having sexual fantasies about somebody else, he finds that very upsetting. Those are the most upsetting things to a man, according to research, when it comes to relationships. And look at it. What does it say? Sex, 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 sex. Right? That's what it says. Women, what they find most upsetting is when they're lied to about resources. That's one thing, right? In other words, you thought he was rich. You thought he had all this stuff. Turns out he was lying to you. He's not rich. He doesn't have a good job. He doesn't really have all those things he said he has. His car is a rental. And he just used it basically to attract you or something like that. He's, he's phony. He's pretending. Women find that very upsetting. You thought you thought you had some rich, famous guy or something like that. Let's take it to the extreme, right? And it turns out that he doesn't have all that stuff. He's not even close. When he lies to you about his status, like he told you something that he's the boss or something like that, or he's, you know, some high-ranking person in the company or whatever it is, and it turns out that he just works there. He's the janitor or something like that. Women find that very upsetting. When you find out that he lied to you about ambition, ambition, he told you he was gonna to go to college and get his law degree or get his medical degree or all this stuff, right? And you thought you had somebody like that. Turns out now he just wants to stay home and smoke weed. He has no ambition. No, he doesn't even wanna to go to college, right? Women find that very upsetting. Depth of feelings. What that means is that you thought he loved you. Turns out he doesn't love you. Women find that very upsetting. Exaggerated kindness. Basically, when you thought he was a lot nicer guy, a lot kinder than actually is the truth, you find out that he's an asshole after a while. He's not kind. He's not nice. He tricked you into thinking he was. Women find that very upsetting. Long-term intentions. In other words, you thought he was going to marry you. You thought he was in it for the long run. Turns out he's just using you. Women find that very upsetting. Before they've had sex, pre-sex, they find it very upsetting. And even after they've already had sex with them, it's very upsetting when they find out that he has no intention of sticking around with you. He has no intention of marrying you, no intention, right, of staying with you. He's just waiting for the next opportunity. He's just using you. That's what women find most upsetting. Notice what men find most upsetting, sex. Everything that women find most upsetting is about a good investment. Turns out he was not a good investment. And you thought he was. All right, now we're going to talk about the more serious stuff, and I'm going to have to move faster, but the more serious stuff, what is all this about? Sex, romantic relationships, getting involved with them, what is this really about? It's about establishing bonds. So we're going to talk about establishing bonds and the need to, along, to belong and infant attachment and attachment styles and that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about raising children in general and how it affects people, right, as they get older, different kinds of attachments, uh, and we'll talk about sexual deviance at the end. We're going to talk about bonds in general. So the need to belong is the need to form and maintain strong, stable, interpersonal relationships, right? We all have this need to belong. We wanna be with other people. It, we, it, it's there the moment we're born as infants. And infants show a clear three-stage pattern of separation anxiety following separation from loved ones. Both infants, by the way, and adults show the same pattern when they're separated from those they love. Some of you have already seen this because you've taken developmental psychology or child psychology. It comes up here as well. Both infants and adults, everyone actually, shows a three-stage pattern of separation anxiety or, or when they're separated from their loved ones. First is that protest, right? First, you know, there's that attempt to reestablish contact. Don't leave me. I love you. That kind of stuff, right? When you're a grown-up or you're a teenager, right? As a child, it, you know, and it could be accompanied by crying, by the way. As a, as a child, they cling to you. They hang on to you. They cry. They don't want you to leave when you're their parent, right? as a parent, right? And you wanna drop off your kid at daycare or preschool, right? First there's protests, they're crying, they're hanging on, they don't wanna let go. And then they leave you. Maybe they leave you in the relationship or maybe they just drop you off at daycare, right? You're the, you're the parent. Then comes despair, right? It's like they're depressed, inactivity, helplessness. They're sad, they're miserable. It's like they're depressed. That's what happens to you after people leave you. For a while, you feel awful. You have this sense of despair. 
And eventually comes detachment where you adjust and you have a lack of concern, coolness toward the parent. You know, in other words, you get used to being dropped off at daycare or at school. And after a while you recover and you say, I'm okay now, you know, and it's, it's okay, mommy, I got it now. Yeah, you can drop me off, that kind of stuff. And they don't cry anymore. They don't really um, show that much distress. They don't really show distress. In a relationship, that's when you get over the person. That's when you say, I don't love him anymore. I don't need him anymore. Or I don't need her anymore. Sometimes they come back around again. They try to hook up with you afterward, right? And you're like, why are you here? I don't love you anymore. Get the hell away from me. That's detachment. It happens when you're a child being separated from mom or dad, right? And it happens when you're an adult, when somebody leaves you, okay? They dump you, so to speak. They end the relationship. And it even happens actually when, you, when someone dies and they leave you in that way. Same pattern. Let's keep going because I'm going too slow. Um, let's talk more about this. Let's talk about more about infant attachment because it is, after all, relationships are about raising children. Okay. So let's talk about Bowlby's attachment theory. Um, according to John Bowlby, we have an attachment system that controls anxiety by maintaining proximity to attachment figures during during stress. What that means is that we all we're all social. We need to be around others. And when we're children, we need to be around mommy, daddy, or whoever's raising us, right? And we wanna be close to them, especially in times of distress, when we're scared, when we're hungry, when we need something, right? The child seeks the attachment figure, mommy or daddy, right? When hungry, when tired, when they're ill, when they're scared, when they're unsure, right? They run to mommy, run to daddy. They make us feel better. They provide security, affection, food, shelter, all that stuff, right? And the attachment system is active over the entire lifespan. We still behave the same way as adults, except that it's not, you know, not like, I mean, we still behave the same way when we're scared, when we're anxious. What do we do? We call those people we loved. We love our partner. We call mommy. We call daddy. We still behave the same way as adults. Okay. Um, and here's what's interesting. Depending on how things go, you might develop a certain kind of attachment with your parents. If your parents took good care of you and you basically uh, had a good relationship with them, uh, you basically learn to, uh, to trust them and you develop what's called a secure relationship, right? It's an attachment marked by trust. You know, you can count on them that they love you. They're gonna be there for you. They're gonna continue to love you and provide you with support. You have a secure relationship. Some people, they don't have such good parents and they might develop an anxious or a ambivalent relationship. This is when they have parents who are in and out of their lives. Sometimes they're there for you, sometimes they're not, and children become anxious or ambivalent. They get clingy. They get fearful of, of abandonment, right? They get fearful, okay? That's that kind of a uh, situation, right? Those that have an anxious, ambivalent relationship, they're fearful of abandonment. They're low in self-esteem and emotional stability. They're, they're very uh, emotional, very sensitive, right? And they're, um, they're not necessarily low in trust and sociability. Okay, it's just that they're they're uh, they're fearful of abandonment and uh, and not so uh, emotionally stable. They're more sensitive, and this is the kind of relationship you have when somebody is in and out of your life. Mommy was there for you, and then she left you, and then she came back. And sometimes she loves you and takes care of you, and sometimes she doesn't. You know, and that's what happens: is you become anxious and fearful of abandonment. That's exactly what happened to me. Mommy was there at the beginning, and then she left. You know, and she had already left my dad. So she left me with my grandfather. So growing up, I had that, I, I was that way, you know, clingy and fearful of, of abandonment, right? Um, she eventually came back for me and, and also my, my siblings, right? And there are some who also don't have such a good relationship with their parents and develop an avoidant attachment. This is a defensive attachment that they're low in trust and sociability. Avoidant, they develop an avoidant attachment mostly because, uh, mommy or daddy, their parents, whoever was taking care of them, ignored them and kind of let them fend for themselves. So children basically, you know, learn that they can't trust them. So they learn to do without them. They don't trust them. They don't really interact too much with them. They don't share their feelings. They don't really talk. Okay. And they're avoidant. Okay. They have that kind of relationship with mom or dad. Here's the interesting thing about this. You have probably the same relationship when you get older. If you had a good relationship with mommy and daddy, chances are you probably have a secure relationship with your romantic partner down the road because you learn to love, you learn to trust. If you're fearful and clingy when you're 
you know, uh, when early on, right? You develop that anxious, ambivalent relationship. You're probably fearful and clingy in your relationships as you get older. And I can tell you that in my experience, that was true. You know, it's like you're still fearful of abandonment. You're still fearful that they're not going to love you. They're not going to take care of you. You don't know if they're going to be there for you or not. And if you're avoidant, then early on, right, uh, you have that kind of relationship. You're like more likely to be avoided later on. You've learned that you can't trust people, that you shouldn't get too involved, too attached. And so you're kind of aloof. You don't talk too much. You don't open up too much. And when you're in a relationship with someone like that, by the way, it feels lonely. Okay. These relationships that you have early on, become the kind of relationships you're likely to have down the road. Not always, but many times. I wish I could get your opinion about this, but I'm recording. Let's talk about sexual deviance. Um, sexual deviance is when you engage in kind of uh, extreme abnormal behaviors, you know, as, a, as an adult. You know, it's like sleeping around, risky sex, risky behaviors that have to do with sex, okay? Turns out that insecure parent-child relationships are a precursor to sexual deviance. If you didn't have a good relationship with your parents early on, uh, you're not as trusting, right? You're more insecure, uh, more fearful, or maybe more avoidant, uh, and you're more likely to get into relationships that are not so good. It's associated with like short-term mating, more one-night stands, more sex partners, more of an accepting attitude toward casual sex. So you're more likely basically to have abnormal relations, sexual relations when you're older. If you didn't have a good relationship early on with your parents, you don't know how to love and trust, then you don't know how to go about it the right way when you're older either, okay? Um, I know I'm going through this quickly. Uh, let's keep going. I wanna see if I can get some time to, for you guys to share what you think. Let's talk about breaking up and staying together. So we're gonna talk about this stuff and um, we'll see how quickly we can finish this. Um, there, there are implicit theories of relationships. What this means is that there, people believe uh, different, theory, different things about relationships. And they're implicit. That means that we're not always aware of them. So an example is some people believe in romantic desti destiny. Okay. Uh, those are they're called entity theorists. Okay. Romantic destiny. Okay. These are people who believe that the love was meant to be. It's your soul made. It's just, it's destiny. So they believe a successful relationship, right? Uh, that what, you know, what that involves is you finding the person who is meant for you. There's only one person for you who's going to be right for you. And you need to find that person. It's your destiny. That's what these people believe, who believe in romantic destiny. They believe that people are either compatible or they're not. If you're not compatible, that means you're not meant to be. Okay? You're not supposed to be together. A successful relationship is apparent right from the start. They believe in love at first sight. They believe that you know, you should know right away from the beginning whether it, this is the this is your soulmate, this is your your the person who's right for you. That's what they believe, right? They fall in love instantly, very quickly. Okay. If the relationship is unsuccessful, that means it was never meant to be, right? Because they believe in romantic destiny. If something's not working out, that's not your soulmate. That's not the person you're supposed to be with. That's what they believe. There are other people that um, are have more of a growth belief. Uh, they believe more of an incremental theory. In other words, relationships are hard. They take time. They require work. So these people believe that the ideal relationship develops over time. You have to work at it. Okay? It's not always obvious that it's right for you or that it's going to work or things like that. Uh, relationships require work. Okay? They do. If you want to stay together, you have to work at it. You have to keep trying to make it work. With enough effort, almost any relationship can work. If you put enough effort into the relationship, yes, you can grow together and help each other and learn to love each other and learn to get along, okay? If you have challenges and obstacles, if you have problems, right, you work those things out and it just makes your love stronger. That's what these people believe. And let me say something else. For these people, um, it's not one person who may be right for you. It could be any number of people. There's a lot of people who are compatible with you, who it could work with. There's not one person. There's no such thing as a soulmate, okay? If you meet a certain person and it works out, it works out. But if you're somewhere else, you might meet somebody else and it might work out with that person. There could be more than one person for whom you know, it could work out with you, 
okay? You get married, you get divorced, doesn't work out, you can find somebody else, fall in love again, and have a successful relationship. There's no one person. There are many people who are compatible. You just have to work at it, okay? And you have to find it, and you have to try to make it work. Now, there are differences for these people when it comes to uh, how they handle things. When there's stress, for instance, work stress, financial difficulties, in general, when you have stress, when you have financial problems, that lowers relationship satisfaction. It makes you feel, it makes your relationship worse. You're less satisfied with it. It increases problems, okay? It increases relationship dissolution rates. People are more likely to break up to get divorced when they have financial problems because it, you know, financial problems cause stress and stress causes problems and arguments and things like that. It also alters perceptions when you have stress, financial difficulties. You perceive that there are more problems. When you're stressed out, you see more problems uh, than you otherwise would if you weren't stressed. It increases disposition or attributions. In other words, when you are stressed out, you're more likely to blame people and say that you're having problems because you're lazy, you're good for nothing, you're a mama's boy, or you're awful, or that kind of thing. You have a tendency to blame each other more when you're under stress. But there are differences between those that have that are destiny theorists and those that are uh, uh, that believe more of an there are incremental theorists. Those that believe in destiny, when they have problems, stress, work stress, financial difficulties, and they start having these problems, they're more likely to believe that the relationship is not meant to be. We're not getting along. Maybe we're not supposed to be together. They believe they can't really make things better. Conflict cannot be greatly improved. We're not getting along because we're wrong for each other. We're not supposed to be together. That's why we're not getting along. That's why things are bad. More disposition attributions, more blaming. You're a mama's boy. It's your fault. It's because you're an asshole, because you're this or that. You just blame each other more when you're this, right? Less relationship satisfaction. You feel worse about your relationship. If you believe in the other thing, if you're a, more of a growth theorist, um, you believe that relationships require work, right? Then when you have problems, you know, you have financial difficulties, you have stress and you have problems, you're more likely to believe, okay, we're having problems, our relationship needs work. We need to talk about this, we need to work things out, okay? We need to find a better way of getting along. We need to do things differently, okay? Um, they also believe that conflict can be improved upon. We can make things better. We need to work things out. We can get better. We can get along, okay? More of a situational attribution. Look, we're having, finan we're having financial problems. We're having problems with work. It's tough. You're working hard. I'm working hard. We're not making enough money. We're having trouble making ends meet. That's why we're fighting. It's not because you're a bad person. I'm a bad person. It's not about that. It's because of the situation. And we can still be together. We can make it work. And they're relatively satisfied with their relationship despite the conflict. They're more likely to stay together more likely to want to work things out and still see their partner as someone who is worthwhile. That is where I'll stop.